Well, thank you. Um, I'm glad we got going today. Sorry for the technical difficulties with the audio. Sounds like a jazz concert last night. Changed a few things, and we can't get it back. So we'll, we uh, uh, appreciate the effort to, to scramble to get a separate system set up and going. Um, but welcome. Uh, this is the, the Soit Lecture for 2022, uh, and we're very fortunate to have one of our great speakers, um, Jerry Buckle, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But the Soit Lecture was set up by Neil and Marita Stewart. Uh, Neil was one of our graduates and one of our academy members from, from a long time ago. Um, but really, they set out to bring other people to Rala, our little hamlet, so to say, uh, many years ago, and to bring world leaders, to bring a new vision and a new idea and a new concept to present to us and to our students. So we're, we're thrilled today to have Jerry Buckwell to with us. Uh, Jerry is with Northrop Grumman, um, and he has basically uh, worked with the CEO directly to set the strategic plan for the entire company. Um, so he brings uh, almost two decades worth of experience in that setting and many other corporate settings where he works as an engineer, but usually on the corporate level to say, where are we going as a new strategic engineer and how can the company get ahead of that? So ASCE brought him in as uh, basically the strategic investment area, um, looking at where we're going to be headed as, as a field. And the project he's going to present here today, along with his thoughts on it, is, is really his brainchild of, of saying how our civil engineers are going to integrate across um, and with no further ado, Jerry Buckwalter. Okay, thank you. Glad to be here. I have to tell you right off the bat that, first of all, this is the first Future World Vision in-person presentation in two years. So it's good to be back out with everyone. Second of all, this is a brand new briefing. It is not, does not match any of the other briefings, and there's a reason for that. Joel cautioned me when I was coming that he was coming to a place where you are already advanced thinkers, critical thinkers, you are forward leaning. And unlike the other schools where I've been, you know, like the laggards at Stanford and the Cretans at Carnegie Mellon and the Neanderthals at MIT, you guys would be way ahead of them. And so I literally am going to do less of the telling of future world vision than the vision behind the vision. Why we did it, how we got started, the thinking, the research that went into it, and then we'll do a little bit of future world vision at the end. So let's just jump right in. We became convinced that there was a variety of long-term global trends that were occurring. And you'll see from some of the videos I've embedded here how I came to believe working for a variety of industries that it was going to cause more change in the next 50 to 100 years than we've seen in thousands of years. And I firmly believe that to this day. Now, how it happens, very uncertain. When it exactly happens, even more uncertain. But I think these things are going to impact what I'll just generally call the built environment. And that's what Future World Vision is all about, trying to get ahead of the impact of these things on our built environment. One of the problems you have though in looking, doing strategic planning and looking into the future is that most people do it on a relatively incremental time frame. Most strategic plans for any organization are for five years at best, maybe 10 years if you're bold. But when you see this many vectors of change coming your way, and you're a bit of a historian as well as a, a futurist, which is kind of what my two hobbies are. I have difficulty with the present, you see. I'm okay with the future and the past. But you realize that the way built environment's going to look in 50 years could be so dramatically different unless you do a strategic planning exercise that actually creates those future scenarios you're gonna get some ugly surprises because analytic continuity doesn't always work well when you think about this many degrees of change. So we became convinced we were gonna look out 50 years into the future to deliberately be provocative and force ourselves to think differently about what that future looks like. However, the problem is, this is the challenges that I list here that everybody has. And so we had to think of a way to get past some of this phenomena, which makes it just so overwhelming that you just, your brain shuts down and you get back to today's problems because you can't think it through. 
So we believed we needed to find a way to create a platform by which you can explore what that future world looks like. You can engage in a very collaborative way. So it's both a visualization of it and a collaboration with all the ideas in it, and then challenge everybody to be more innovative and creative in how they're going to think about solving those future problems. So we did a video just to kind of describe that path we were embarked on. This is about two years old, two, two and a half years old, but it's a nice synopsis of what we're trying to do. We'll see how it works here. Autonomous vehicles, climate change, new materials, high-tech construction, new policies, those things are all converging in the world of tomorrow. To take a look out 50 years is not typical, but we felt with so many changes, we had to free ourselves from today's constraints and take a step out that far. We're here to create a professional tool rooted in a future that's highly plausible because we're doing deep research with renowned experts in their field. Because 60% of the world's population live in coastal areas, we're starting with the floating city. When we did the work on the mobile offshore base, we had a system which is seven times an aircraft carrier. If you get very heavy weather, it will tear it apart. They are now actively looking at putting large arrays of solar floating in space and using microwave to bring the power back to Earth. At night, that solar-powered array will lower the kelp to a place where there's more nutrients. Sun comes up in the morning and they can grow. Once this gets going, it's almost an unlimited amount of biomass that can be used as a source of human food. The master planner of today will be a kind of DJ that will be there for 15, 20, 30 years, constantly tuning to make the optimum atmosphere for the people in that city. It's also very, very important to do this in a way that is respectful of the context that it's in. Engineers have built nations over thousands of years. Now we will need to become masters at systems integration. In this virtual world, users will engage the analytical tools of today on the world of tomorrow. This is going to be a very exciting ride. How did we get started? Challenging project, but let's go back a minute and I wanna spend time on what thinking really launched this. And I'm gonna do it with two videos that describe that gestation process that we videoed right at the peak of COVID a year and a half ago. So you'll have to bear with me. You know, I'm sitting in my spare bedroom and the other guy's in his garage. So bear with us, but it really tells the story of how these things can come together to create a project like this.
Nope. Someone that wasn't working before either. But, you know, I met him at the ASCE Innovation Contest uh, and user, the winner's event, which Disney hosted in Glendale, California, shared the idea with him. And he just immediately lit up and said, that's what we do at Disney. We research, we engineer it, and then find a way to appeal to the hearts and minds to change the way people think. The way they, and, and then if you can change that, you change the way they behave and be, begin to prayer, prepare for things. So this though means we had to do a lot of research. If you don't do the research, this is just another science fiction story. It must be rooted in research, otherwise it's not plausible. So that's one of the things we had to do. We had a whole team of people and we literally worked on 108 different global trends of every sort. We did a variety of environmental and natural resources, alternative energy demand, biodiversity issues, climate change, natural disasters, you, you name it. We did economic ones. You'd be surprised when you do long range planning how you have to look at everything. It's a complex world that all impacts each other. So we looked at everything from housing to energy to fiscal policies, financial institutions, banking, asset bubbles, all sorts of things. Geopolitical, we took a look at the nature of conflict around the world, what's causing those things to cause human migration movements, all those kinds of things. How shifting power around the world is actually going to impact that because there's a demographic and climate impact from that and all of that impacts the built environment as well. And then we looked at societal phenomena, just the population growth, the urbanization patterns, those are kind of obvious but the whole digital information stream or digital lack of information stream that goes on, uh, generational expectations, aging populations in some places, youth bulges in other places, try to take a look at all of those things. Lastly, we looked at a very long list of technological factors. Normal ones that we think about like GPS, cyber, the benefits and risks of cyber, but lots of things we see, there is a tremendous amount of R&D going on in bioengineering, uh, autonomy, cognitive systems, things that go well past what we think of in the next five years. And we thought those things are gonna impact the built environment. We gotta get a good look at those things. That just gives you a feel. We spent half a year on this with the consultant and a team of about 30 people. By the way, when I formed the team, I had one rule. Only 50% of the team would be engineers. And of that, about 75% could be the variety of civil engineering disciplines, but I wanted other engineering disciplines. And the other 50% had to be everybody under the sun. We had bankers, finance, economists, sociologists, psychologists, people from the faith community. I mean, you name it, because again, unless you look at how society is going to use the built environment from their perspective, we often miss things. But once you do all that, you then have to narrow the focus. So after all that research was done, we ended up with a construct that narrowed it down to these few things. Ultimately, they led to the six big trends that I showed you right at the beginning. But we had to map out kind of these sequence of things over the timeline that we thought they would reach maturity and begin to impact life as we know it. And then, of course, there's some ubiquitous trends. Financial dysfunction, governmental dysfunction that sometimes get in the way or can enable what you want to do. Uh, general security issue, population dynamics, those apply ubiquitously everywhere. Keep in mind though, that in my former career, we did this from a very different perspective. One, I come from the military industrial complex. We spent ungodly amounts of money on this. Tenfold what I spent on this project. And then sadly, it gets classified and locked in a vault and nobody gets to see it. 
Meanwhile, as I described with my homemade video, I was working with a gentleman from the science and technology uh, part of, of the CIA. He, believe it or not, was a partner with me on the Industry Leaders Council at ASCE. And he said, Jerry, the impact is equal, if not greater, to the built environment as it is to national sovereignty issues. How can we help use this kind of process and system to help this industry get their hands around the likelihood of what's coming our way? But we have to do it very differently. We want to boil it all down, the drivers, the uncertainties, the outcomes, I'm going to come back to that thought a little later, that drive to the realities, in this case, focus that would have the most impact on the built environment, and then the resulting engineering partnerships, organizational roles, university challenges, and the skill sets and capabilities future civil engineers would need. So that we did. One last point on the research. We always do this in a very holistic way. It's almost a three-dimensional thing. It's hard to show on a two-dimensional slide, but everything impacts everything else. You keep having these iterative loops where you look at this phenomena and then you try to see and you tweak them to see what the future scenario would be depending upon a plausible set of assumptions. And then you look for multiple points so that you can test your hypothesis based upon very different future scenarios. So we had dozens of these this one happened to be one for smart cities on one aspect, but I just show it to, to understand that it, you can't be simplistic. You have to embrace the challenge of the complexity of this, or you can end up with some blind spots. Well, I wanna talk about two implications and then we'll go on to more of the, the product itself that we're working on. One, engineers are gonna keep doing what they need to do. We are the world's problem solvers. That's what we do. They're going, we're going to do more of certain things that we've already begun. We're going to get better at harnessing technology advancements, computing power, responding to, I would say, both environmental and demographic trends that we see happening that has an implication on what we build. We're continuing to advance our ethical standards, and we're going to look at the risk sharing, life cycle, performance-based kinds of things that we have to do. We're already starting this. We're going to do far more of that. However, if you look out far enough, there's some new things we're going to do as well. There's going to be new engineering challenges, and it will actually create new specialties. I showed the video when we started where we started on the proof of concept for the floating city. There will be some very unique new civil engineering disciplines by the time we get to doing that. We have since shifted and produced the mega city first, not the floating city. But I think a big one that I keep talking about all the time is systems thinking, a systems integration approach, which is inherently multidisciplinary, wide range of expertise and wider than what we even do now. That will become the new normal. You can't solve complex problems without getting everybody's input. And so that will create some new partnerships that are right now less familiar to us. So we believe that is an important thing to recognize is coming and therefore, how do we get prepared for it? A couple kind of urgent takeaways, and this was from the research phase. If I had to summarize it, I, we had a long list, but I summarized it to these five. And everything we've done since then, I keep coming back to this. Are we preparing for resilience in extreme environments? And by that, I mean both environmental and demographic patterns. Embracing digital models and, and big data use, which I don't mean in just the way we think of it, but when you picture a world where there's an actual integration between the digital ecosystem and the physical ecosystem that we typically build, which is coming, everything will become sensorized. I think I probably just made up a new word there, but it will. And we're going to be responsible for it because we're the civil engineers. We have to incorporate new materials, new technologies. I already talked about the fourth one, system dynamics, integration. And I think to do all of this, we have to get better at promoting a culture of innovation within our profession. That's my fig. The rest, I got a lot more videos that'll be more exciting, but to me, 
as a scientist, as an engineer, that's my money slide. That's the one I take away and say, I have to keep in mind the research shows that's an overriding five themes I have to keep thinking about. So next we move to the phase we're in now, which is how do I create a way to affect the culture of our industry and the population in general. And ASCE as a leader bought the idea that that was our responsibility because I, I'm not sure who else would do it. Doing the research as expensive as it is, is a drop in the bucket compared to this next step that we've had to do. We've had to create using basically gaming engines with this firm experimental in Los Angeles, a, you know, a fully immersive environment with characters, evocative stories, life at a macro scale city level, right down to a district, to a street corner, and even into a building and showing what happens to people in that. And we are gonna work on five fully developed future worlds, future communities. We call them city worlds, but they're future communities. And Mega City 2070, which is what I'm gonna show you next, is the first one we are completing. But that is the next challenge. So we are in the middle of that right now. Those are the five cities that we talked about. Mega City, and again, we put them kind of in a timeline that they might emerge. This is not an attempt to predict anything. Future planning is not without predicting. There's a simple reason. We always get it wrong. Take a look at all futures. They always get it wrong, especially the timing. But what we know is when we see if I go back to those five principles, if I go to the future scenarios of all five of these, and I start to see those five common elements, now you know it doesn't matter which kind of city world you're gonna be designing infrastructure for. Those five things are what's worth burning some calories on. You gotta get the neurons firing on that because those are ubiquitously needed in any future scenario. So we have a host of, innovations that we've researched. And now the research changed from the kind of the factual research to how we're gonna visualize it. You can imagine experimental challenge. They were actually on the phone with people who live at the laboratories in Antarctica so that they could get a feel for how they would show what a frozen city kind of future might look like. But let me, let me just describe these briefly. Mega city is the classic next gen of our mega cities today, 50 million people hugely vertical and horizontal, very dense. We know we've got those coming. We also believe there's, not everybody's gonna live there. There's, so we call it the, our antithesis is the rural city. What does that look like and what might be drought-like conditions? We hope that when we get that one funded, we might even make a little bit of it look like what the, the global South is facing. So we can see that impact in rural areas. Floating cities, we had a choice. Coastal cities are just starting to wrestle with this. And we had a choice. We could look at what the coastal city needs to do to kind of embrace the inevitable instead of just trying to prevent it, you know, something more than just seawalls. Or we could look at the phenomena where some people are going to move inland. And what's that look like? Or we could talk about a sea-based solution. We picked a sea-based solution for no other reason that was more provocative forced you to think differently. And that's all we're trying to do here. We also have a frozen city. That one's driven by something I don't, a lot of people haven't really been paying attention to, to the extreme. As the sea level rises and the climate warms, the Arctic channels are opening. The first Panamax ships carrying global supply chain goods pass through the Arctic for the first time in late 2018. You can move any of the world's goods to any other point in the world through that channel at a 50 to an 80% savings over any other path around the globe you can take. So we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that the world's supply chain is gonna start moving through the Arctic. And that will mean we have to figure out how to build infrastructure on the permafrost to figure out how we support the global movement of goods. It's, in my mind, it's one of those things you get 50 years from now and you look back and you say, why didn't we see that? It's obvious. 
that one's obvious to me. Now, what to do about it is the next challenge, but it's coming. And then just because we are enjoying ourselves so much, we're gonna take a stab at an off-planet city. A lot of the students react really great to that. That's obviously this last one. Now, obviously the uncertainty increases as you move to the right on this chart, especially the time. But in my mind, it doesn't matter. It forces us to think through these implications. So that's the path we're on. Let me then show you again, just a little bit, I'll just do a couple of slides. We used a device with experimental that we call the mandala. We take all of that information we researched and all the interviews we did, and we place it in this circle, in the appropriate pie slices, if you will, of resources or infrastructure or culture. We look at the outer rings, which is what's happening in the world, and then we narrow it down to how it affects us right down to a street corner level, but always with the perspective of what's its impact on the person at the human level. What's the quality of life issues? What's the societal benefit issues? And we color code the bubbles of these topics based upon those original lenses that match the six drivers that I showed you right off the bat at the first slide. We do an interview process where we pick someone who's an expert in that area. There's just a sample, we do interviews. Those questions start to bleed over into questions in other areas. There's this cascading impact where then they look at what that area would respond with in the economy. What does that mean back in urban planning? And it bounces back and forth and informs each other. And you end up with something like this, which shows you two things. One, it shows you by the size of the bubble, which is size based upon predicted impact, which areas we have a good or better grasp on uh, a good grasp on and which ones have most impact and some gaps where we still need more information. Now, that bubble looks, that mandala looks very different for a mega city versus a floating city, particularly the size of the bubbles, but it helps us wrap our head around what the impacts are and what we should be visualizing when we move to the current phase. So let's talk about the mega city. That's the one we're releasing right now. By the way, that first be full beta version of that software platform is available now as of February 22nd. You can go to futureworldvision.org. There's a button to download it. You can put it on your computer and you can dig in. There's tours, there's instructions, and I encourage you all to do it. You'll be amazed by the amount of material we have baked into that. This is just a sampling of some of the key features that in Megacity we surfaced. Everything from waste management, building optimization, the result of coming back post pandemic to community activities, green space, energy, and roof features, which are very unique in a Megacity. So those aren't all of them, but it's a couple big ones unique to Megacity. And I think we have I'm gonna keep on going. I'm going the wrong way. A video that shows kind of a snapshot of the features and discussion and research and conversation we went through in Megacity. If you don't make a plan or make a goal and have a vision, then you just react your way into the future. And that's not what we wanna do as civil engineers. We want to lead into the future how we do our jobs as civil engineers, maybe as systems engineers, will be different in the future. What are the different cities we see evolving? And how can we really get an understanding of those cities? How can we immerse ourselves in those cities today? What are the different social infrastructures, physical infrastructures that can be created in which we can all come together and thrive? What's really important about looking at this through a world building lens is that it is designed to look forward and then thread back into the present. The further out you look, the more it changes our view of the present. We're literally forced to not only reimagine our communities, uh, but to rediscover our neighbors, to rediscover many of the things that uh, are right in front of us. We're spatializing narrative 
and allowing the user to tell their own story as they navigate the experience of this virtual cityscape. What can a mega city grow toward so that it's serving a better purpose? You start looking at individual buildings then because you can typically shape a building and can you connect several buildings together? The buildings might form coalitions and, and interact with the utility and the utility will interact uh, with the uh, providers of energy all around. That becomes a transactive energy system and the buildings can play an active role. I can design a microgrid that serves that district. Or if we need the microgrid to serve an adjacent district, we layer those together. We need a water supply system that can meet 15 million people's needs. Every building in the future should be capturing sunlight and rainwater, and every building should be recycling its own waste. Ideally, the life cycle of infrastructure is one that is continuous or perhaps reused in the future without going back and re-emitting all that carbon to do the same thing over again. That's the way we've built over the last century and we simply cannot do it anymore. Buildings are not unlike a human body. They have bones and skin. They consume energy and regulate temperature and generate waste. What if architects use genetic tools from synthetic biology to encode the architecture of buildings right into the DNA of organisms. The facades now become active components. And one active thing that facades can do, they can breathe or they can sweat. You can infuse biological functionalities into structural building materials. Almost 100% of all the controls in buildings are gonna have some element of AI in them and machine learning. As you walk into the building in the morning, the building will uh, recognize you by your electronic signature. You would have created a profile about your temperature, your ventilation preference, and then some of this microenvironment might follow you. What would social cohesion look like in the city of 2070? I mean, it's reasonable to expect that it would actually be vertical. So, you know, going vertically also brings its own challenges in terms of safety and security. You might have 175 drones coming in at 11.45 a.m delivering lunch. Where do they land? How much space are between them? What are the specifications? It just has to be designed in a way that people can interact and making sure that you're encouraging paths of travel that are spontaneous. We're at just the right point in time to get together and build basically the aerial equivalent of what we did in this country with the national interstate highway system and no longer be restricted to two dimensions. So how do you get the public involved in civil engineering, in the process of civil engineering? One of the best ways that we can make sure that all voices are heard and included is to start with the people who are doing the planning and developing and see what their teams look like. How can you ensure social equity and social justice and get input from the community for the projects that we're working on? We are very conscious about the demographic, the diversity of the community and the society, and make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. Creating these multi-use spaces is one way of doing that, of bringing people together. And once they're in the same shared space, there is more opportunity for connection, there's more opportunity for shared experience, there's more opportunity for civil dialogue. The best solutions on Earth, they come with diversity of thought. What I love most about the Future World Vision Project is that we can think about it together. We can have this dialogue. Users will encounter one another and have conversations across disciplines that will begin to feed back and bring new information into the system. We're trying to build a world and trying to build a machine that is creating absolute engagement of the user and of the engineer in their own future. The Future World Vision is really at the core of what we're trying to do at ASCE in transforming the idea of what a civil engineer can be. And that's how we think that we can advance the profession of civil engineering and attract the best and brightest. Oh my goodness, this fourth industrial revolution married to the fundamentals of concrete, glass, and steel is this incredible toolbox for society. It's really on us as civil engineers to pull that all together. So one of the things I like to do next, because that's a great video, but I want to just give an example. 
It's one thing to look at the macro level, kind of exciting. Notice all the call out buttons you have, which then bring up the research. There's over 300 of those already embedded with a set of ties to where the research came from and who participated. And then a social community debate section where people can dialogue about what did we get right? What did we get wrong? Something's emerging in the next two, three years that show this is gonna happen faster or slower. This is meant, Alex McDowell, who was in this, who is the founder and, and creative director of Experimental. I don't know if you know any of his, uh, his name. He was a, you know, a classic Hollywood production manager. He worked on mostly Steven Spielberg movies. Anybody remember the Minority Report movie? Yeah? He, Steven Spielberg, it was the first movie that was done. They asked Alex to create that future world. He spent two years of research. He got, he received over a hundred patents for ideas that actually came to pass from that movie way back then. And they did that for two years before they wrote one word of the script because they wanted the script to follow Alex's world building. He's since left Hollywood. He has his own firm and he does world building, this kind of exercise for corporations and organizations all over the world. But that we tuned this up, not just to do the macro picture, but to drill into specific kinds of engineering examples. Things like, how are we going to use the modeling tools? How is this vertical dense space going to be used? Uh, I, I love the one structural elements. Structural elements are no longer just structural elements. They are both structural elements and sensors and energy collectors. And they attach to other pieces and they all report their ability to communicate. That, that's really coming for sure. Uh, we looked at everything like power in a hugely vertical uh, you know, city where in fact you would do all sorts of microgrids right down to, we even looked at the concept of you know, kinetic energy uh, taken off the elevators as they move up and down. And just, we, we explored all of it. So I wanna make sure everybody understands this is not just to tell a story. We do wanna tell a story because we wanna reach people who aren't engineers about what it is we're going to do. I actually believe telling that bigger story is the way you get the next high schoolers into civil engineering curriculum because they'll react to stuff like this. They'll understand what we do better, but we also wanna use it to debate professionally the kinds of things we're going to do. With that, I'm actually gonna take, if you go into the futureworldvision.org, we've already created what we call some guided tours through Mega City 2070. And we've created five or six now on some specific disciplines. Just an introductory tour on energy, on water. I picked one out here just so you have a feel that of, of what a tour, what an exploration of some of the, in this one I picked, uh, uh, I think structures and architecture. Um, just so you have a feel for that. Here's the great news. When you log in and create account, you can do your own tours and record them and use them in your classes. I mean, you can record your own tours of anything you wish. So let's see, I'll just use this one as an example. Structure and architecture. Cities are largely defined and understood by their structures and architecture. And while our iconic buildings must protect, inspire, and often last for hundreds of years, they must also be able to adapt to shifting needs and perform many functions in an evolving landscape. Engineers and architects bring expertise in sustainability, resilience, preservation, and livability while they work with the community they serve to shape the identity of the built environment. In megacity, structures are reconsidered to serve many uses to make the most of their space and resources over the course of the day, week, month, and longer. Designs are optimized to account for robotic maintenance and deliveries. Space is provided for businesses to grow in closer proximity to the customers they serve. And affordable residences and services extend the benefits of diverse and accessible communities to all corners of the city. The concept of mixed use development extends to the structures designed to attract and accommodate large numbers of visitors. 
Frequent reconfigurations of these spaces must not only cater to crowds, but must maintain livability for long-term residents through crowd management and sound control systems using artificial intelligence. Creative approaches to green space are necessary to ensure that growing density does not come at the cost of the well-being of the population. These living systems maintain the connection between human, nature, and buildings, and are also woven into the internal systems of these structures, producing highly efficient and effective architectural marvels. Yet, megacities' advanced approaches to architecture and structural engineering take place in the context of richly historic structures that must be respected and maintained as part of the physical and cultural landscape. Preserving historic structures is no small feat of engineering. Modifications are made both above and below the ground surface to ensure stability as sectors like the downtown historic core continue to expand vertically. As a city of 50 million inhabitants, Mega City must always be prepared for worst case scenarios. Structures that serve day to day as vital points of cultural gathering and celebration can quickly transition into emergency shelters and response facilities should the need arise. While at first glance, these exciting advances in architecture and engineering may appear to be reserved for only the most upscale neighborhoods and tourist attractions, that is not the case in Mega City. Some of the most advanced technologies and revolutionary approaches are seen in areas where the participatory nature of urban living is most vibrant, and where single mixed-use developments become mosaics of modular innovation driven by residents. In the end, that's what we have with Megacity. Its software platform is out there now. Uh, feel free to download it. We have a host of other things that we've done. We've actually created the beginning. It's in a beta form of, a, it's called the Future World Vision Primer. It's a set of five video modules and RIP supporting materials for use in classrooms. Uh, those are, that's, that's available. And, and, and we're trying to create a bunch of support material to go around this so that we get the full value of it. But bottom line is, this is a very, again, multidisciplinary, multi-factor, holistic view of a plausible future, highly dense megacity. I said this in the past, this is not a tool to design with. This is not a tool to solve the problem with. Engineers already have those. This is a tool to ask your, ourselves different questions with a longer term view. That's all this is, it's as simple as that. Alex McDowell, when we first started this, said, I said to him, well, what should we call it? And he said, it's simple. This is a provocation machine. That's all it is. It's to provoke yourself to think about things differently so that you begin the first steps toward preparing for it so that it's not as disruptive as it needs to be. So you end up with the desirable future scenario you want because we've learned over time, it's all too easy to create the slums of tomorrow. Let's figure out what the steps are to make this happen differently. So we have all sorts of community. I will tell you in the mega city, we show mostly desirable outcomes, but we show some pretty dysfunctional ones too, because that's the way you learn. That's where you create a debate on, well, how do we avoid that? I don't like that. So we've done both to provoke ourselves to think about what we do today that is probably good for the way we need to do that same problem in 50 years. More importantly, what are we doing today that doesn't appear likely it's likely to be beneficial 50 years from now? Therefore, what do we have to do differently? Those take a long time to shift. So this is to provoke us to begin to think about those things. Now, I'm gonna talk about just quickly about how we hope, and we have several different users already using this. Even people who have been involved with this just through the beta phase. Uh, the, full, the full final version gets launched this October, uh, but we have the beta versions out there. You can download it, you can do whatever you want. We're looking for everyone's input. So please help yourself to it. And lots of helpful videos in it. Education and awareness is a big one. We already have a, a professor at Colorado State who's actually taken the beta version and given his students a problem to look for in Megacity and they have to tour it and then write a paper on it. 
we have a professor at Carnegie Mellon who actually loaded our beta version in their visualization lab and requires the students to go to the lab one hour at least to play on it and tackle how that view of the future is good or bad and how civil engineering could make a difference. Again, just to start that process. So education and awareness is a big item. And I think that also applies to the challenge engineers who build infrastructure have with our sometimes public owners and operators, our governmental policymakers. They have a hard time understanding the challenges we face. And those policies sometimes get in our way. That's going to get worse unless we find a translation tool to help them visualize what we're talking about and how we take those steps differently. We believe there's also ways you can look at this. We show lots of multiple ways to handle food crises or fire services in a very different way in a mega city, which is different because that huge verticality opened up the door for us to consider some different things. So it's ways that we can look at that. I think it's also a way we can prompt the creative process. In my mind, one of the reasons I ended up with Peter McGrath was a firm believer that engineer, engineers, I have to be careful now, engineers don't like change. Engineers, we're used to define the problem, give me the constraints, and I'll go solve it with well-worn proven tasks and processes and measurements that have proved reliable and safe. We can't ever stop doing that. But in the process, innovation has stalled way more than we like to admit. And some other industries, some other disciplines have, have evolved much faster than us. I'm not saying we lose those roots. I'm just saying we have to find a new balance point. And this is a way to help spark that, but it still needs caution. And then I actually think there's ways, we called it pandemic planning, but it's just preparing for all sorts of disruptions. We built three, what I'll call disruptive, unexpected events into our research and our uh, visualization. We made that decision back in 2017, what those three would be. It's almost scary because we weren't trying to predict anything, but we built a global pandemic into it. We built into it a global food shortage based upon a GMO failure. That one hasn't happened, keep your fingers crossed. And then scarily, we built in a regime change in the world that would spread to global impact. And here we are looking at the news in Ukraine. It's not because we were so smart, if you look at a long multi hundred year history, you know, all of those things will happen at some point. It's just a matter of when, nobody knows. So planning for disruptive, highly uncertain timed events is a good way to think about how we, our designs are as resilient as they need to be. I think this is a good way for even individual projects, both the consulting side and the government owners to actually talk about the project benefits. This visualization tool helps the, practicings, the practicing engineer's client really understand this. And I know several firms that have already started using even the beta version to help with those concepts. Secondly, it helps us start preparing for, preparing for industry disruptions because things are gonna change. We all know these consulting engineers don't have draftsmen sitting around tables anymore. That's different. We got a couple more of those things heading our way. It's gonna be very different. We have to prepare the industry and other industries for how this is all going to happen. So those are kind of, we have teams of volunteers working on potential application of this product to those kinds of use cases. If you wanna get involved in any of them, just send me a note because I think that's the important thing that we have to do to figure out how to practically apply the money ASCE has spent on this project like this. Lastly, just because the board, I think, is so uh, committed to this concept, uh, everybody know uh, the Dream Big project, the, the movie ASCE made, right? The board voted six months ago, 
and authorized me to go get another museum and science center, big screen TV di uh, display and a set of interactive um, booths available for release to science centers and museums around the world. And so that contract has already been launched that will release in October of 2023 and probably debut at the uh, Science Center in Chicago. But we're already writing and negotiating contracts around the world for a giant screen movie and set of interactive hands-on exhibits that will travel to science centers around the world. Now, naturally, like Dream Big, we hope that we spawn some high school curriculum for that and kinds of local elements, just like we did with Dream Big, where we bring the community into that science center and take advantage of talking about civil engineering with the community, with young people, families. So be aware uh, the ASE board has authorized that expenditure. Uh, and we are in the, in the beginning stages of actually, final, uh, script was finalized yesterday. I did that uh, while I was traveling. Uh, and, uh, and, and they're picking characters and narratives. They've actually, been negotiating with some teenagers from the uh, Smart Cities competition around the world. Uh, that happens and the winners uh, all applied and three of them have been selected to be featured in our Future World Vision Mega City 2070 movie. And so along with mentors from the high school that, that have been helping them. So that is underway. And here is a quick trailer that shows the kind of impact we hope to have. Again, this is all about public awareness, but it's an important part. Teachers are losing marks at an alarming pace. Intensify significantly, as you can see by is now the second largest in state history. That's the end impact that we hope to have. Good summary of it. 
you've heard the points on the dream big uh, teaser that we made. Some of you may have sensed uh, what I'll claim is uh, some influence that I feel that I've had on that. Uh, and that is this, this has to reach pre-college. We have to inspire pre-college. And through the museum program, I think we can do that. We can reach millions of people a year to, in the normal attendance at science centers to, to, to young people to inspire them what civil engineering is all about. Just like Dream Big did, only in a different way. This one's looking at the future. So, but across the board, you can read it for yourself. That is kind of a summary of the impact that we said we wanted to have from the beginning to impact this. Um, and, and that's where we're heading. I, I wanted to give you this big feel because it's not just the software platform. As expensive as that was to create on a gaming engine, it's all these peripheral elements all together. And I'm, I'm just so pleased that the ASCE board had the vision because God help them, I'm spending a lot of their money. Yours too, if you're a member. But the good news is Dream Big, hopefully we'll get some of that royalty revenue back in just like we did with Dream Big. So that's one one source of revenue that comes back with at least that aspect of it. But that's kind of a full picture. I will, I will offer this as a closing thought. As you can tell, I come to this from an engineering perspective, but one which was not a civil engineering perspective at the outset. I've lived in multiple industries. And the last half of my career, I've always been dealing with the future of whatever that engineering industry is both from an educational standpoint and from a practicing standpoint. Where is it going? How are we getting prepared? Are we thinking out of the box enough to, so that we're not caught by surprise? Now, as I look out at you, I see over the course of the last hour, some heads nod, a few smiles, and not, not a small amount of glares that say, that guy's off his rocker. I've been studying technology phenomena most of my career. And I, I, I ask you to just think back for a moment. Just 50 years ago, what do you think handheld communications would look like? Okay, enough said. It's, you can't imagine the change that has occurred, but it's not just a technology change, it changed our lives, changed behaviors, it changed the way people think. I think we have to anticipate similar phenomena with some of the changes we see coming our way. And some of it is well underway and I don't think we're aware of it. So I'll give you one example with a story and then we'll stop and take some questions. But in my previous lifetime, I hear everybody getting excited about autonomous cars, okay? Got it? Technology is getting pretty robust. Safety record is phenomenally good despite what some people say. And, but we have a whole ecosystem that has to change around it to accommodate that. That's going to be hard. Civil engineers, transportation engineers are going to have to figure that out. But I see too many people kind of looking me askance, at me askance and saying, well, is the technology re really there? Is it, you know, because it's got to be really robust before you get market adoption. So let me give you a corollary. Has anybody heard of the uh, program uh, called, a system called Global Hawk? Hands, anybody? One? Okay, so you can't answer. Global Hawk is an autonomous aircraft, not a remotely piloted aircraft, autonomous. It's not a little drone, it's bigger than a 747. You program, now it's built for the military and NASA. You tell it where you want it to go. You don't pilot it. It chooses its route. It chooses its path. It changes its path based on weather, et cetera. It flies up to 80,000 feet. It does that over secure military airspace, usually in the Southwest of this country. At 80,000 feet, you're above the national airspace of every country in the world. Therefore, no one knows it's flying or where it's going. Relax, it's not weaponized. It doesn't have munitions on it of any sort. 
but it's got tons of reconnaissance and surveillance assets on it. And also relax, I can guarantee you, Northrop Grumman does that platform, so I know it's never turned on while over the continental United States. That would be a violation of what we hold dear. But boy, does it turn on everywhere else in the world so that we know what's happening when we need to know it. That's a phenomenal story. This thing flies around the world and back without landing. And no one knows it's there. It's not stealth or anything. It just flies so high. No, there's a whole team of people in the command center, but that's just to download the data from the payload. It's not flying the aircraft at all. Pretty impressive, right? How long, how long do you think it's been flying? Almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. This stuff isn't new. We know how to do all this. This is just a matter of when regulations and civil use catch up with what's already there in technology. And then we'll start using it because there'll be some obvious benefits to it. So I just use it as an example. When I see stuff like that in that world, I know those are signposts to tell me we got to figure out the civil equivalent of that because it's going to happen, but it has to happen under different rules of engagement. We need to involve policymakers, et cetera. That's where the challenge will be. But my next important point, I want civil engineers at the table with the policy people when we decide how to do this. We're the ones that have to figure this out. We don't wanna just leave this up to policy people. So that's the kind of thinking. No, we don't have Global Hawk in the mega city anywhere, but I want, when, that's just an example of where I, I don't know when it'll happen. I gave up predicting timing a long time ago. I just know it's going to. I don't know whether that's 20 years, 50 years or hundred years but I want civil engineers to solve today's problems, but take 5% of their time to think about this. Cause then we become the, the on the point master designers and builders. When those folks who are in the room now are students or your students are at the peak of their careers, 30, 40 years from now, they need to start now to have a little bit of this introduced into their thinking. Uh, it's not as harebrained as we sometimes think it is. Enough of a speech, Joel. I'm open to questions, spears, just no automatic weapons, okay? Right here. Okay. You kind of alluded to this just a second ago, but uh, take your mega city, for example. A component in the mega city accomplishes more than one task, if you will. Today, in our curriculum, when I say, let's just something simple, like a concrete beam, concrete beam so big, rebar here, 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 and it performs a structural duty, okay? In order for the engineers, the civil engineers, to be able to design these mega cities, we've got to come back and say, okay, how do we change our curriculum to anticipate being able to design for the mega city? Right. How do we go about that change and getting that initiated? Because if you don't start that, you don't get to the end point. So the question is, how do you design curriculum and activities for students to begin to prepare for that uh, converged world where components like a structural component has multiple functions that it has to do that we talked about? It's a great question. And it's not easy. You already have a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> you already have such a challenge getting through the curriculum you have now. I mean, this is, you pack it all in. So how are we going to do this? Uh, a couple of thoughts, because I don't have an answer, but I have a couple of thoughts. One, you have to figure out what some multidisciplinary educational uh, uh, venues look like. And, and I don't mean, you know, stitch together your civil engineering with your transportation engineering with your, and just mash it together and call it a day. No, no, that's not good enough. I'm sorry, just not good enough. You, I'll tell you one example that I was blown away with. I did a lecture at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I don't know if you I know Dave Zombeck, who was the chair there, invited me in. I did my, I did my lecture. I went to a class. I can't even tell you what it was on 
but there were three professors in the class, active, teaching the class together. One was a civil engineer, one was a computer science teacher, and one was a sociologist. And they were teaching about something from the perspective of all those. So you were thinking again, like I say, about the outcomes of what we're designing and how people are gonna behave and use it and how we're gonna digitize it, a big, a big issue. That's a great example. I don't know if that works everywhere, but I think we have to start thinking about that kind of multidisciplinary, maybe it's not a course, maybe it's a set of projects. You set up a project with, a, with another department and you figure that out. Um, I think this tool could be used with a different department in any university you wanted to and set up a project and teach them about the world outside that they're gonna connect with in that way too. Because this is a common you know, platform anybody can tap in anywhere. So I think we need to see some things like that um, to make multidisciplinary real. The other thing we have to do is I think we have to embrace a little bit of a broader reach to the scientific community. Engineers are all about application. So that's what we do. But I'll give you an example. At Northrop Grumman, back when I was there, we worked with a firm uh, in synthetic biology. Now we, we, weren't, we built planes and satellites, you know, cyber stuff, we didn't do anything. But there was a cutting edge synthetic biology company happened to be in Boston and we designed with their help, in this case, using organic, synthetic organic material of things like chameleons or some sea fish, a way to embed that in the actual the structural ex, the skin of aircraft and jeeps such that you didn't paint them, but with an electric pulse, literally from an iPhone, we could change it from desert camouflage to forest camouflage. That's getting perfected right now. How are we, how are we gonna figure that, that? You have to have a synthetic biologist start to have some lectures in your civil engineering courses to say, geez, I never thought about that. But, the corollary of that is, you know, look, I, I got stranded. I took the Uber from St. Louis to here last night, you know, in 30 years, I'll call the Uber with one click and then I'll change the color of the Uber to match my shirt or tie, you know, next time or, yeah. I, I'm being frivolous, but I'm just trying to provoke people to think about that. And then you have to figure out what that means in the educational setting, which is not going to be easy but you have to figure out how to cross departments as a start in a meaningful way, not a superficial way. Last thought, and Joel, this will be a hint at one major point I'm gonna make at the department heads conference in Portland. We, we talk about the I engineer, the T engineer, the Pi engineer, familiar with those terms? Look, historically you teach, and that student demonstrates mastery in something. It's the I engineer. Then we have the T engineer where you gotta have mastery in something, but you gotta have a systems view. I talk about that a lot here. I'm a firm believer that's necessary. Not everybody has to be that, but from a practicing engineer in both electronics, aerospace, civil, I'm convinced 20% of the population 20 years from now has to be a T engineer that can be system integrators. And those who aren't comfortable with that can be the I engineers. They, they go even deeper in their discipline. That's okay, you can have both, but we need more who are T's. I think the future, and pi, not the slice of pi, the symbol pi, has to have two legs of depth. Not, both don't have to emerge in the university setting, but I'll tell you what I mean by that. You need your structural engineering. It's got to have a, It's got to be deep in something, or your environmental, or you know, transportation, whatever it is, geotech, you name it. They have to have some T. But over the course of their career, by mid-career, they have to have a second leg that develops, and that can actually be tuned up to what their life mission can be, or what their passion is, to enhance that discipline they have. In other words, it could be 
in sustainability. It could be in ethics. It could be in software, digital stuff. It could be in, but you can't get it all done at the university, but you have to stage them to understand that they need what I what we don't want is anyone who's a T engineer without the without the stem on the bottom. That's just thin integration. You got to have a specialty. None of this conversation takes away from the need to have your specialty learned at the university level. But some have to be ready to span, and some have to be ready to embrace an additional second learning path in computer science or digital applications, because that's going to be a big part, or sustainability or resilience or policy, or can be any number of things. But that second leg creates this additional well-rounded engineer that can talk to policymakers and owner operators and all those other things. We haven't done as good at that as we should. Again, it's not easy, but we have, to, and some of it has to be accomplished by the people who hire them, but we have to all think that way. That's the only way engineers who ought to be masters of the future built environment. God help us if we let it go to just computer science people, because they'll code anything. If you ask them to, we're the ones who are responsible for the health, welfare, shelter, food, transport, and communication of the people we serve that we build this built environment for. No one else thinks as broadly as civil engineers do. We're ideally tuned up as a discipline to be the ones who will become the best at this in this kind of a complex future world. Not a long talk, not a good answer, but some examples of how we have to at least begin embracing that. I wish I had a better answer, but we're at a very fledgling state in this and we're overwhelmed. You run out of runway every day, just trying to teach the curriculum you have to get done. So I admit, Columbia University, another example, instituted for about 25% of their civil engineering students a fifth year where they have the time, not everybody has to do it, but for those who apply for it, the time to get that extra step of integration and second depth and, and you know, maybe that's something lots of schools could, some simply get it through the master's program. But for those who aren't going to master's, maybe that extra lead, they call it the leadership program. But it's not just soft skills, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Buys you a little extra time because your curriculum is so jammed. And I'd also say if there's anybody online who has a question, uh, please put it in the, the q and Ignore the man behind the curtain, no. Okay, the question is, how do we get this to come to fruition? Uh, how, how do you get the world to see this this way? How do we wait for policy to happen, which is uh, history has shown us doesn't usually happen. You're absolutely right. We can never, government by its very nature cannot lead the way. You can even find a few champions, but their, their career culture, their elected official cycles, all the things work against them for truly long range policy making. That is really rare. So in my mind, this is about changing. And again, yeah, we'll have to start by finding a few champions, which will be rare at first. And that is, I, I often talk about this as engineers in practice, have to get out of the mindset that for every single customer, just tell me what you want me to build and I'll build it. And by the way, I'll do it right and I'll do it with high quality and I'll do it safely. 
they have to add to that and say, let me sit at the table during the design and development process so that we pick the right project. We'll be consumed if we're only doing the project right. We must also have a seat at the table to do the, pro the right project. Otherwise, you never have time. So that's one way. So there's this political advocacy thing. Now, I'm not a daydreamer. I know that most of the clients of most practicing firms aren't of that mindset. So you can't abandon them. But every, every engineer in a practicing firm has to be looking for a few champions. They emerge slowly at first. But when they do, they set an example and all you need is the first two or three and the other policymakers, all, all their eyes pop open and they start to follow. But we got to crack open those first couple by building a trusted partnership, you know, client provider partnership such that we have a seat at the table and actually talk about the right thing to do using tools like this and other things Otherwise, you're right, we'll just be reacting forever. And then we'll sit here 50 years now and say, hmm, got the same mess we did before. It, it's just the way it happens. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the way life works. Um, I'll give you a classic example. And again, while admitting these clients are rare, but they're starting. There's a consulting uh, civil engineering firm. Uh, this one happens to be in Pennsylvania, I think, headquartered there. And they were asked to design a rooftop autonomous air vehicle landing and recharging spot for LAX airport. Now, that's pretty advanced. And LAX has no plans for that at this point. It wasn't the Port Authority, the Airport Authority to ask them to do it. As you can imagine, it was Google. They took the job. They called me. I gave them an even earlier version. A, a, it wasn't even the full beta version of this. But then they were able to go to Google and say, okay, here's your vision of what you want. But they just walked them through some of this and said, uh, but... So what if I can charge it? How long do you need me to charge it? Where's it going in a downtown LA 30 years from now? What do those landing spots look like? How, would, how will it come back? And they, if you do those things, now, you, now your, your customer treats you like a partner and say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Now, that was a starting point. Those have been rare. But I can tell you that contract was two years ago, maybe three. And now LAX calls them because LAX realizes, honey, let's Google designing portals on the top of LAX. I got to do this. And so we find somebody at LAX. And the first one that called was somebody who just wanted to figure out how to hide the study because they don't want to deal with this. And the next one got called and said, no, we have to figure this out because I that guy was 62 and I'm 42. And when I still got to figure this out when this starts to happen. That's just an example. Is it going to be easy? No, in fact, it's going to be painful. But again, we become the victims of the change instead of the enablers of the change if we don't try to find those few things. And then you get that customer, then he will finally start to change the policy and say, well, wait a minute. So what's our regulations for flying an autonomous air passenger carrying vehicle from LAX to downtown LA? By the way, not saying you have to do it. If you can't find them someplace, you go look someplace else. And, and, and yes, they're only gonna be a small portion for flying. But I, I'll tell you right now, Switzerland has already enacted that policy for all their airports to downtown locations all over the country of Switzerland. They are jumping ahead on this, that exact problem. We are in the US lagging behind in most of those kinds of things. Now, it's not a fault. It, we got a huge scale in this country. This is hard. Tougher to do it for the variety of terrains and demographics that we have here than in Switzerland. But guess what? The rest of the world 
They do it the first couple of times, start landing those, and there'll be delegations from the U.S. going to Lucerne and to Geneva, and they'll be coming back and trying to figure it out. We want to be partners with them in that process so that we can help guide it here. It's just an example, but I wish I could give you a more concrete pathway, but it's a messy world and that's the way it's gonna happen. And it starts slow, but there's gonna be a knee of the curve on every one of these, and then it's gonna go. Anybody else or from, go ahead, Joel. I think there's a risk of that uh, for two reasons. I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Okay, I'll be in the box for now. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, we monetize risk differently in this country than other countries do. So it's easier to step out without fear of some lawsuit in some other countries to gradually experiment with these kinds of things. It's just financially less risky. That is, is holding the US back. We have a very risk averse culture because of the litigiousness of our society. I know that's not a good thing to say, but I'm telling you, I've watched it in multiple industries and it's always true. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have the innovation creativity to do it. We do. Our governance issues tend to hold us back. In other countries, so they have that advantage, and there's nothing wrong with adapting it quickly because the U.S. will have to get caught up in some of those areas if it merges somewhere else faster. It's not the end of the world. Uh, we'll do that. Um, I had a second point and I forgot it. But that, that's, that's part of the risk. Um, I, I, I'll give you another one that drives it is infrastructure finance. These are long-term phenomena. We build most of our government-owned infrastructure by floating bond issues. You know what the universal constraint on anything you build using a government bond? you can't spend any of that money for the life cycle cost of that asset. It's constitutional restraint across the country. Most people don't know that. Why do we think, why do we, think we have a crumbling infrastructure system? Because we were not, if we use the bond financing mechanism for publicly owned infrastructure, we are prohibited from financially planning for the life cycle cost of that asset. Other countries don't do it that way. Canada, Australia, several others have leapt way forward in using private financing and create deal structures by which the entire life cycle of the asset is funded. And that is hugely advantageous when you're working on long life cycle stuff with massive innovation in it. Because you need to plan for that because there's so much uncertainty. Yet. You got to play that out. You got to play it out in a way that you know you can get the return on that asset for the citizens. But in the US, we put handcuffs on because we float the bond issue. You know, everybody, uh, there goes our, my taxes, okay? And, but you get it done. And, and, and then you come back to them 10 years later and tell you want more money for, it's just a problem. So infrastructure finance and our own governance structure gets in our way. So my suggestion there, if this was a crowd of government people is find the most innovative, first world implementing infrastructure cities in the world and create some twin cities, create some partnerships and start trading information so you can get comfortable with how, what possible is. Because right now it just doesn't feel possible to them. And it's not their fault. That's the constrained system by in, in, in which they live. So it's, uh, it's a, it's a challenge. I have been working with global private equity infrastructure finance people for over 20 years. 
and almost all of them never invest in US infrastructure because the deal structure is terrible and it's driven by the bond problem. Now that needs a lot of nuanced conversation. This is a very deep subject, but it's, it's part of our construct that, that holds us back. Um, so we, again, we can't solve that. We got to get with the policymakers and the government people. And my, when I was working on national sovereignty issues, and I saw similar headwinds to the way we do like Homeland Security, which I worked in deeply for years and became convinced there were countries in their world that were, were doing Homeland Security technology application and services that were pretty good. And most of what we were doing in the US was what I called Homeland Security theater instead of what I knew could be done. I took those, I took the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and took him to London and I took him to Tel Aviv and I took him to other places to say, you have a natural constitutional constraint here, but you need to know what the rest of the world's doing that is so much more effective. And then you can come back and decide how you want to tackle it because you're the government guy. It's not me, but at least I can be your partner to help you understand what industrial capacity could do for you as is being done in other countries if you can find a way to champion that. So I'm not suggesting engineers are the ones to solve it. I'm not suggesting we're the ones to partner with our government owner operators to help them figure it out. And part of that is just linking them with other people who have figured it out. Hey, that's how we all learn everything we do. You link, once you get past to the university, you, you learn from experience by linking with senior people who figured out lots of problems you haven't figured out yet. This is just another variant of that. I think there was an... Thank you. It's exactly what we need. That's exactly what we need. That we, we, the policy, you know, those who talk, you know, political science, we, that's a ripe, you talk about a multidisciplinary approach, that is a massive connection we can make right now so that those graduates are energized in a connected way. Agreed. I yeah, I, every university has a different mix. There's different dynamics. I'm just saying, all I'm saying is the more real you can make those connections, the better your graduates are prepared to permanently connect with those other disciplines and solve the complex problems of the future. You might take a certain specialty. I mean, you might do a connection at, at Carnegie Mellon Dave's working more toward the connection of civil engineering with the computer science because he realizes this digital nexus that's occurring. He wants to really get that going. And the sociologist for human behavior. Others could take a policy. I mean, every university will take a different spin. Students will choose you based upon that. And that's how you fight for your fair, your market share with the student population. Create those specialties um, and then figure out how to make them meaningful. Uh, but to, to your unsaid point, you got to have some champions. This, this is hard work. This is not run of the mill. So yeah, you're going to have to put some energy into this to make it real. But I'm, now the good news is this isn't changing overnight or next year. We have time. My future world vision premises, we don't have to fix this. We just have to take the first step. And the next year we take the next step. We have to get started and then we'll figure out how, because sometimes these things happen or faster, happen faster or slower than you think they are anyway. But at least if you've started crawling, you're ready to walk and then you're ready to run and you can observe the signpost to know how fast you got to push this uh, with the various constituents who have different ideas in your university setting because everybody's got a valid viewpoint. This is, I'm just sharing my personal view here. This is it's full disclaimer. You're getting the Buckwalter view, not the ASCE view on these questions. For your next slide, 
Omega City 2070. How much of the, you mentioned echo friendly materials, advanced materials, and, and technologies. How much of these materials are, and technologies are, have not been invented yet that will be used in 2070? In 2070? <laughs> Percent of the construction use of graphene. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, I think I think graphene's a big, big one that's coming. Uh, here, I, I don't know a good percentage, but I'm going to say, for what's going to be in place in 2070, we might only even know 50 percent of what we might use. I mean, I we're we're not there yet. But the other encouraging thing is, if I look at the, I do a lot of analysis on national. R&D spending and what it's spent on, we're finally fully ramped up on material science in R&D like I've never seen it before in the last five to 10 years. So I'm very encouraged that while it might be 50% or somewhere around there, we actually aren't, it's not just cross your fingers. That amount of investment generally is a harbinger that we're gonna see things in the next 10, 20, and 30 years that actually are gonna make a difference for us. So. <laughs> I'm discouraged today, but I'm encouraged by the attention and funding that I see going to the material side. I think we're a little more interested in the country uh, piece because look at you know the United States GDP is so much larger than you mentioned Canada. I mean we can't compare. Right. So and I, I do agree the, the litigation piece is big, but I feel like some of the stuff is the government is restricting like regulatory and all that kind of stuff. But the entrepreneurial piece seems like it's here in the United States. Uh, here, so, again, this is based upon years of working this in not just this industry, different industries. So it's a very holistic view. I agree with you. We are no, we have no shortage of innovation. We have no shortage of creativity. We have a massive shortage of innovations that get adopted into mass practice. And by that, I'll go back to relative to the built environment. Now we've seen it in other areas. I mean, take health and medicine. Oh my goodness. Um, you take telecom, <laughs> incredible. But in civil, despite the huge gravitas and momentum of the economic status of those assets, our, our cultural disposition is to keep it all focused on do it affordably, and by the way, make sure it's safe. And I applaud that. But I can tell you, I can't even count how many CEOs in consulting engineering practice, if the room is closed, say to me, well, my decision on how much to spend R and D uh, on R and D to adopt into the civil engineering practice is all based on what the case law is for litigations in, in the particular thing I'm in. So if I'm in bridges, you know, everybody thinks of the bridge that goes down. And, and so they gate their, they gate their percentage of R and D in civil engineering with a first focus on risk aversion, risk minimizing risk. So I think the, the creativity is there and it's wonderful, but in, and I can see where there's different regulatory and cultural settings. It blossomed in telecom. It blossomed in some military aspects, aspects, it blossomed in health, it blossomed in medicine, it blossomed several places. But in civil engineering, we, we've somehow had this constraining culture on the adoption of it. Would you say the same thing like energy and like nuclear energy, we're first even trying that anymore? Yeah. There's you know, green energy there, we're not tapped into it very much. Yeah. I, the risk aversion is so high. Risk aversion is high. Uh, we quietly, we don't make a big deal of it, but in our analysis, as we look out to 2070 for a mega city and more localized power generation and power distribution microgrids, there is a healthy blend of all classic alternatives and micronuclear. 
we don't make a big flashy thing because we're afraid that people are going to react. But reality is, if you look at the research, there's no other way we're going to get there. It's just reality. And we're not going to ignore reality. I'd rather put it in there and let everybody debate me and get mad at me. That's okay. Um, because that's what it is. And it'll be different other places. If I was sitting in Iceland and I got the kind of geothermal energy coming out of the ground, well, I'd take a different approach. But for most countries, it's going to be that kind of a blend. And again, that's not meaning I'm, a, I'm not an advocate of moving to as much alternative as we can affordably do as quick as we can. I'm just saying it, we've got to be realistic about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we got to plant those seeds now. Uh, I've been looking at the micronuclear stuff. I think some of that's really promising. And again, because our nation reacts to a story on Fukushima. It killed nobody. I, I know. Or any of that. I, and, I, and I understand it. I'm not saying, I'm just saying I lived in a world where we put sailors in tubes under the ocean with a nuclear power plant that they lived with for two years at a time. And we, we didn't have any health problems at all. We know how to do micronuclear with containment and surety. Some of those kinds of approaches can be developed into civil solutions. But we have to be bold enough to do this emotional reaction but we do that to so many things. We're, now, now you're going to set me off here. I'll give you my pet peeve. We're not developing critical thinkers. People are willing to look at hard facts, assess the data, get the emotion out of it, and figure out what life is going to look like. And stop with the, with the mis, it's not just the misinformation. You can reach bad conclusions with the right information as if you just, you know, you, we got to develop critical thinkers. And that's, again, you talk about the rest of the curriculum and multidiscipline. What's it take to develop? That's a lifelong ambition, but we got to get better at it. We got to get better. At it. But by the way, that's the area where U.S. universities, personal opinion only, because I've visited lots of them around the world, are actually better. Our students know how to think and question if we guide them right. You go to the European model, still pedagogy and develop, and they develop wonderful subject mastery. But some universities in the in, in the in the European setting really haven't addressed that T part of the model hardly at all. We have we have capability to here with our student population to actually tackle that, but we've got to address all of these things and mastery and all those other things too. But we're the next generation has that cultural mindset. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm big on, I, I, do, I do lectures on um, what I call uh, long range planning of all sorts, mostly technology planning, but also I have some what I call um, critical thinking slash you know, systems thinking. I kind of combine the two. Um, where people you just need to stop throwing out spurious correlations, you know, and all sorts of other things. And that, as though they've proved a fact, and then they set us on a course to invest in things that just don't make any sense. Um, so again, I, and I'll tell you why this is hard in engineering by a personal example. And then I think Joel's ready with his hook. Um, I was an engineer. I was an electronics engineer. I became an aerospace engineer. I became much more of a systems engineer in practice. But 20 some years ago, the CEO of Northrop Grumman pulled me out and said, you're on the corporate strategy team. There's gonna be six of you. You report to nobody but me. And we're gonna look at what the world looks like 20 to 50 years from now. Because he took very seriously that the national sovereignty of us and our allies depends upon the industrial capacity of about six to eight companies around the world for really big stuff. We need to take that seriously. And we need to behave like global citizens that believe that seriously. And so he said, I need everybody else to run the business, 
but I got to do all sorts of what if scenario planning to say, well, what if the world looks like this in 30 years? Because it might take 30 years of industrial capacity building to get there. I've got to place really big bets that are risky. You're on that team. And that's where I lived for the next 20 years. About a couple of years in, I was having a ball. But I went to him, I had lunch one day. I said, why? I didn't ask for this. There's only seven. Why did you pick me to do this? And he said, that's easy. Now, I'm, I'm waiting to tell me how smart I am. Or, and he said, we're an engineering company. You're comfortable with ambiguity. You're not the traditional engineer that wants to focus on a problem and solve it. You're okay with multiple outcomes. And yet it still has to have the same rigor applied to it, but we have to be able to put probabilities and, and you're comfortable with that kind of uncertainty. Most engineers have a huge problem with that. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes we have trouble with critical thinking. We have to be okay with having multiple paths, none of which are perfect, because it's not in that tightly constrained, <laughs> give me the problem, I'm gonna solve it. I apply the rules I know. It's a little bit different thinking, but it takes, everybody can do it a little bit, just takes practice. And, and uh, the, the second reason that he didn't tell me was because you're a lousy engineer anyway, I need you to do this, you know. Got people better than you to do the real work. Thank you, it's been a pleasure.